members. Ministry is, is oftentimes a series of good news followed up by bad news. Oftentimes that's just the way it goes. And uh, someone will come to the pastor sometime and they'll say this. They'll say, Pastor, we've got good news. The ladies' Bible study voted to send you a get well card. <laughs> bad news is it just passed 11 to 10. Just squeaked by. Good news is the elders accepted your job description just the way you wrote it. Bad news is they were so inspired by it, they formed a search committee to find someone who was capable of fulfilling the job position. You were Good news is Mrs. Jones is just wild about your sermons. Bad news is Mrs. Jones is also wild about Desperate Housewives, American Idol, and Harry Potter books. Good news. Church attendance has risen dramatically the last two weeks. Bad news is you are on vacation. <laughs> it's good to know sometimes where you stand. Well, as we continue to study the letter that Paul wrote to the believers in the region of Galatia, this morning Paul is going to answer the question for us, where do we stand with God? Where do we stand with with God. Last week we learned that no one is good enough. We cannot be good enough. We cannot stand on the law because we cannot be perfect. No one is, is good enough. We need grace. Amen? We need grace. This week Paul continues that argument by proving that because we can't stand on the law, we need then to stand on the promise. We need to stand on the promise. If we want to be in good standing with God, we need to understand what it means to stand on the promise. So I'd like you to open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. We'll start with verse 15. Curious, how many of you have at least once, we've been at this for two months now, how many of you have gotten through the letter in one sitting at least one time over the last couple months. Great job. Not asking out a legalistic requirement, just asking and uh, challenging uh, all of us. If you haven't had the chance to do it yet, maybe this will be the week. If you have done it, it uh, wouldn't hurt to do it again. Here we go, verse 15. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant, that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Just pause for a second. Think about your will. If you have a, a will, uh, you and your lawyer worked on that together, and it was signed or whatever, and I can't come in and change that. Your kids can't come along and change that, even though they might want to. That's what he's talking about. We'll, we'll use some more examples here in just a moment. But he's talking about, uh, in, in a legal sense, uh, we understand that when a contract is, is completed, that's it. Someone else can't come along and change it. And if I have an agreement between me and Jesse, uh, I can't go and change that without Jesse's consent. We have to work on that together. All right, here we go. No one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, plural, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person who is who? What's it say? Who is Christ? What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not now set aside the covenant or the promise previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a what? Through a promise. So last week, Paul was arguing that the promise that God made to Abraham to bless the world through his offspring, back in Genesis chapter 12, that that promise has priority over the law because the promise came before the law, hundreds and hundreds of years before the law. This week, Paul's argument is that the promise not only comes before the law of Moses, 
But when the, when the law does come, the law can't come in and break the promise. It doesn't have that authority. It doesn't have that power to come in later and then break the promise. Let's say that I promise to give one of you this nice candy bar. Right? I make you a promise. I promise I will give you this candy bar. Uh, what did you do to earn the candy bar? You don't do anything. It's just a promise, right? I promise to give you, to give you the candy bar. Uh, you believe me. You believe that I am trustworthy, and you say, "Okay, thank you." And so you wait. You wait patiently until the right time. Then I give you the candy bar. If I later on, let's say a couple of years from now, you're still waiting, and I still <laughs> intend to give you the candy bar, uh, but you you're waiting patiently. You believe that I will give it to you. But then I come along and I say to you. Oh, by the way, if you want the candy bar, you've got to wash my truck and mow my grass. Yeah, right? Well, from a human point of view, that would be rude, right? Would that make me someone who keeps my promise or someone who breaks my promise? Which would it be? It would be, my, it would be breaking my promise. Right. Go back to the original promise. I make you a promise. I'm going to give you the candy bar. You say, you believe me, you say, okay, thank you. You wait patiently. Five years down the road, Walt comes along. And Walt says to you, hey, by the way, you know that candy bar that Pastor Mark promised you? Oh, you've got to go wash his truck and mow his grass. Now, if Walt said that to you, what would you say to Walt? Hopefully you would say, well, mind your own business. <laughs> That's not the promise that Pastor Mark made to me. He promised to give me the candy bar. I believe him. And when the time is right, he will give me There's benefits to being guests, huh? <laughs> oh, your wife, your wife gets the candy. I'll bring the house, yeah. There you go. These Judaizers, these legalists, here's what they were doing. They were coming into the church in Galatia, and, and they were trying to add to the promise. They were saying to the, the believers there, yes, God promised salvation through Abraham's seed, through Jesus, but then God gave Moses the law, right? And so God added to the promise. He changed the contract. That's what they were trying to promote. Now, if God then comes along and makes a promise, and then somewhere along the line decides to just change it, would that make him one who keeps his word or one who does not keep his word? Would that make him someone who keeps his promise or not keeps his promise? Not. And that was Paul's argument in that first section. You've heard the saying that a promise is a promise. Most of us understand that a gift is a gift. The promise that God made to Abraham was a gift. You don't make someone pay for a gift. And God always, always, always keeps his promises. Go back to verse 16. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to gloss over it. Verse 16 says that the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is, who is Christ. The promise that God made to Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The law was uh, given before the promise was fulfilled, but the law is not able to come in and replace Christ. It doesn't have that power. If I give, uh, let's say, we'll use this as an example. Let's say I buy a new Corvette. Right? I buy a new Corvette, and the first thing you're going to think is, we are paying this rascal way too much. <laughs> I purchased this new Corvette, but in the way Corvettes work, there's one factory that makes them. And a lot of times they're custom made, so you don't get them right away. They don't make these in mass production. So uh, I've got to wait for it to come from, from the factory. So it's purchased, but I've got to wait for it to arrive from the factory. So the dealer that I'm working with uh, is really a great guy, and he says, Pastor Mark, uh, you know, while you're waiting on your Corvette, I want you to take this smart car, and I want you to drive it around while you wait on the Corvette. It gets great gas mileage, it's easy to park, it's got limitations, you know, but it'll work until you, until you get your Corvette. 
So I do. I ride around in the smart car. I look like a goober, but I, it gets me from A to B, right? Then one day, I get the phone call from the dealership. It says, Pastor Mark, your Corvette has arrived. Does my smart car replace the Corvette? Yes or no? No, it can't. If I were to say, you know what, I think I'll just keep driving the smart car, I'll leave the Corvette at the dealership, that wouldn't be very smart. smart. <laughs> the promise is better than the law because it was only meant to carry God's people through until the promise was fulfilled. And who fulfilled the promise? Jesus. If you want to be in right standing with God, you've got to stand on the promise. You've got to put your full faith and trust in Jesus, not in your ability to keep the law. We learned last week we can't do it. We need to stand with the promise. We need to trust in Jesus. And you would think that that would settle the argument, that that would settle the matter. Paul would be able to end the chapter here, end the book perhaps, with an exclamation point and a raspberry. Got it. But he doesn't. The secret to winning a debate is to know your opponent so well that you can anticipate their next move. And that's what Paul does. He continues this argument. He must have anticipated the Judaizers. Maybe he could, in his mind, uh, hear them as this letter was being read out loud at church on Sunday. He could almost probably hear them uh, crying out, All right, then. Then what was the point? of giving the law to Moses in the first place. What was the purpose of the law then? So he answers their question. He asks it, and then he answers it. If you go then to verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. Calvin and Hobbes uh, was... A uh, cartoon many years ago, not that many years ago, I guess, but the uh, little boy, right? Imaginary tiger. Remember that? In one of the cartoon strips, Calvin was on the sidewalk. He's waiting for the school bus. He's talking to his tiger, and he says this. You know, school would be uh, a lot better if we didn't have to go every day. And uh, if we didn't have to do all that homework. And if we could get rid of all the teachers and about half the students... If school was completely different, it wouldn't be so bad. Calvin wanted the purpose of school to be different, but his desire for it to be different did not change the purpose of school. The legalists, these, um, these Judaizers, they wanted the purpose of the law to be a means of salvation. But that was not God's original purpose for the law. And Paul, knowing this, he restates the purpose. Here's the first one in what we just read, verse 19. He says the first purpose of the law is that it exposes our sin. It exposes our sin. You see that phrase there in verse 19 that says, uh, because of transgression? See that? That means that part of the purpose of the law is to help us understand what sin is. The law helps define what sin is. But it also does this. It also uh, reveals to us the holiness of God. We see in the law this stark contrast between the holiness of God and how woefully inept we are in our sin. When I was in junior high, uh, we played basketball and our coach had a friend that used to be in the in the NBA. And so if one day for practice, his friend was in the area and he came and uh, helped run the practice for that day. Now we played five on two. It was us five players against our coach and this guy used to play in the NBA. Now compared to guys our own age, we were a pretty good team. Most of us were we could handle the ball well, could shoot pretty well. We were, we were a pretty competitive team, pretty good, compared to guys our own age. But when we played against the man who used to play in the NBA, we found out real quick just how woefully pitiful we were compared to him. And the law does this 
for us. If I compare myself to others, if you compare yourself to others, well, it's not going to be too hard to find someone that we can look at and say, hey, I'm pretty great compared to that guy. Right? It's not hard to find that. We can all do that. But we can't compare ourselves to others because we aren't the standard. God is the standard. And the law shows us just how holy God is and how sinful we really are. And we need that. We need to understand that. We need to see that stark contrast. Here's why. The second purpose of the law is that it highlights our need for the promise. Let's read on. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Now just pause there. It doesn't seem like it fits, but he's, he's continuing the argument that the promise it has priority over the law because the promise was given directly to Abraham. There's no mediator of angels in, in between. So it's just a continuation of that argument. If you go back then to verse 21, he says, Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? His answer is, absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So that, was, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The second purpose of the law is that it highlights our desperate need for the promise. The law was given to show us just how desperately we need this promise. Once we realize the law is impossible to keep, then that creates within us a desire for the promise. For example, people try to sell us, and you, I'm sure, junk that we don't need all the time. Right? Uh, people say, hey, you really need to buy this health supplement, or you need to buy this special rag you can soak up five gallons of water with just one rag. Or you need, the, every time you go to Walmart and you buy something electronic, you need the extended warranty. And most times what happens when you buy the extended warranty, it breaks a week, you know, after the extended warranty runs out. So we, we understand that in our world, uh, people are always trying to sell us things that we don't really need. But there are some things that we do need, and we don't even realize that we need them until the need presents itself. If you would have come to me a month ago and said, Pastor Mark, I was walking... Uh, around your house, and I noticed uh, up in the eave of your house, there's a, there's a little gap up there. Well, you really should get up there and close that gap, because you're going to get bats in there if you don't. A month ago, I would have said to you, you know what? Go try and dupe someone else. There's no way the bats are, it's a tiny little gap. We found 60 to 70 bats uh, in the eave of our home, and when we, when we saw that, uh, right away we understood the desperate need that we had right, for some type of solution to this problem. I'm not the solution to that problem. I don't do heights and I don't do bats. But we needed a solution. It clearly highlighted our need for that solution. And the law does the same thing for us. It highlights our desperate need for the solution. And we, when we look at the sin in our lives, when we look at the holiness of God, we quickly understand that we are not the solution. If we did not have this understanding of our sin and the problem of our sin, we would have no uh, desire within us to be saved. We would see no need for grace. So we have... The law that points out our sin problem. We see the holiness of God. We see that we need the solution. It points us that we need the solution. And then the third part of the law, the third purpose of the law, is that it points us to the solution. It points us to Jesus. Let's uh, finish out that section, starting with verse 23. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. We were locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge... To lead us to Christ. Now, I don't know what word you have there as far as being put in charge. We're going to come back and take a look at that here in just a moment. But it says uh, we had this law put in charge of us to lead us, to point us to Christ. That we might be justified by what? Faith. By faith, not by law. 
Now that faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. That goes back then to that phrase uh, of the law being in charge of us to lead us. We'll look at that in just a second. My son Elijah came home from camp a couple weeks ago and uh, had a really great week. Uh, he looked like he was all intact, so that was all good. And uh, he told his mom that he got this award for having the neatest packed suitcase for coming home. His mom was real impressed with that. And she said, wow, great job, bud. I'm really proud of you. He said, well, you know, it really wasn't that hard. I, I never unpacked it. <laughs> the boy wore the same clothes all week long. So looks can sometimes be deceiving. Our son needed a bath and a change of clothes. And this is what the law does for us. It reveals to us that we are in need of a cleansing. It points us then to the solution. It points us to Jesus because the law can't cleanse us. It's like this. The law is a great mirror, but it's a horrible washcloth. The mirror shows our true condition. It points out that we need soap and water. But we do not take the mirror down off the wall and try to use it to wash ourselves. The mirror can't cleanse us. We need Jesus. No matter how bad we want that mirror to do that job, it can't. We need the washcloth. We need the soap and water. We need Jesus. It's like the song. What can wash away my sin? What's the answer? All together now. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Right. So Paul uses then, as, he, as he's uh, describing the, the purpose of the law, he uses this really interesting word. He uses this term, paidag agos. Now you might not have that actual word there. You might have the word schoolmaster. You might have the word teacher. Uh, but the word is paidag agos. And a paidag agos was a slave. A slave uh, who was used by a Greek or a Roman family with the duty of being in charge of or supervising a young boy in place of their parents during the day. Right? So uh, the pilot Agos would take the young boy to school, uh, protect them, watch over them, discipline them if necessary. But what makes this parallel so interesting is that the pilot Agos was not permanent. The boy would eventually become a man. And he would gain his day of freedom. And then that relationship between him and the Pidot Agos would change. It would change. We're going to look more at that next week. We're going to take a look at this transition from boyhood into manhood and what Paul's describing there and how that relates to this idea of law and grace. But this morning I want you to see the image he's describing here is is the duty of the law in our lives is that it watches over us. It guides us. And it causes us to yearn for the promise. It points us to Jesus. But once we have Jesus, our relationship with the law changes because now we have the Holy Spirit. Now we have the Holy Spirit to help us live out the things that are described in the law as far as uh, how to avoid sin, how to live a life that glorifies. Let's think about now, as we finish up for today, how this impacts our lives every day. The most obvious impact that we've been reading about for the last three chapters is this solid argument that Paul has been making over and over again. That salvation is not found in the law. That you and I cannot earn it. We cannot be good enough. But rather that salvation is God's gift of grace. Through faith in Jesus, He is the promise. So when we ask the question, where do I stand with God? There's only two possible answers to that. Either with Jesus or without Jesus. Right? I'm either standing on the promise or I'm standing on something that will crumble beneath my feet. I think even those of us who are standing on the promise Right? You've trusted Jesus Christ as your forgiver of sin. You've trusted in Him alone as your salvation from hell. You're trusting in, in His Holy Spirit to transform your life. 
even those of us who have that, I think we still need to wrestle through the questions about am I standing on the promise when I live out my Christian life? Am I standing on the promise or am I standing on the law? Here's how it fleshes out. If, if I am, uh, if I have the heart attitude or the mindset that uh, I serve God and I obey God because I have to, then I am standing on the law. And most likely I will do whatever minimum requirements I think I have to do in order to keep God from being mad at me, in order to keep God uh, on my side so he likes me and does what I want and doesn't uh, mess with my plans. Right? That's standing on the law. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to keep God at bay, to keep him happy, keep him appeased. That's standing on the law. But if I serve and obey God because I want to, because I love him. Ah, that's standing on the promise. And watch how that changes. Now, uh, when I serve and obey God, and because I'm doing it because I, I want to, because I love him, then not only am I going to try and find lots of ways, lots of ways to love God, to love others, you know, to, to, to serve him, to obey him, but I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I want to, and I'm going to enjoy it. Now that, to me, standing on the promise, seems like a much better way to live my Christian life. Would you agree? It's almost like God designed it that way. Where do you stand with God? Where do you stand with God? You're standing on the promise? You're standing with Jesus? That's the only way to know for sure that you are in right standing with God. It's all about who? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your promise. Thank you that you are faithful to always keep your promises. And I thank you most of all for the promise of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we consider where we are at spiritually, perhaps our those here in this room today who aren't really sure where they stand with God because they haven't yet trusted Jesus Christ alone. Maybe they've been trying to uh, appease you with their good works. Maybe they've been trying to earn their way to heaven. And Lord, I pray that your scripture has exposed that law this morning. That your, your word has pointed out and shown very clearly to them. They just need, they just need Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who have trusted Christ, I pray that you would help us day by day to live out our Christian lives in such a way that uh, we're living out a life of love, not a life of duty. That we would stand on the promise, not on the law. Help us to do that. And we thank you for the strength through the Holy Spirit to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing Standing on the Promises. If you have a spiritual need, if you'd like to have someone pray with you about, I'll be here.